are, uh, as a congregation, hated by many of those who, you know, so-called Churches of Christ, we're hated because of the things that we say here. Uh, but in fact, they're true. And the, the speaker that I am uh, going to present to you is, uh, you know, I, I recall some years ago at an appreciation dinner for uh, Brother Al Rice, he described himself, as in the church anyway, as the most hated man in America. Well, I think now that we have the honor of, <laughs> of having as our preacher and as the one to present the uh, lesson today, the most hated man in America. And you think about why he is hated. It's because the truth is uh, people are being confronted with the truth and they don't like it. They like the comfort of doing whatever they do that is contrary to the scriptures, thinking themselves to be acceptable to God. In fact, they uh, believe that God must accept them for the error that they preach. And they don't like it when that error is exposed. And I can assure you that the speaker of the hour, David Brown, will expose that error. But he's in good company. We also have here the most hated eldership in the, in the country. <laughs> so so you, if you like to be hated along with uh, those who stand for the truth, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you. But uh, David is going to speak to us today on the Holy Spirit Makes No Earth Sense by Terry Rush. And we've had the honor of uh, correspondence with him here recently. So David, come speak to us. I hate to give elders a stopwatch when I'm about to preach. <laughs> I've been sitting down here trying to mark out what I'm not going to say. Somebody said a moment ago, well, he doesn't have it down now. Why is he studying? He had nothing to do with studying. Somebody asked Brother Bales one time concerning a debate he was about to be in. He said, when did you start studying for this debate? He said, let's see, I think it was about 46, 7 years ago. Well, I think all of us preachers understand what he meant. Uh, your whole life is a study, and all of that has to do with getting ready for whatever particular topic you're going to address. I uh, started to say, well, if I'm the most hated person and the eldership are the most hated, then which one of the elders is the most hated elder? And we won't go into that. <laughs> but I do appreciate Ken's uh, <coughs> remarks to me and for me one of the hated elders. <laughs> he mentioned a moment ago, and, and it is rather, as we, and every one of us always know in all the lectureships, we say it anyway, there's so much we'll leave out, it's in the book, but we'll try to say what needs to be said, this ex, expose of Rush's book, The Holy Spirit Makes No Earthly Sense. Uh, if you don't know who Terry Rush is, he's uh, preached for the Memorial Drive Church of Christ in Tulsa since back in 1977, when I was in Muskogee. And also then in Tulsa, then we heard quite a bit out of him in those days. And the circles that he walks in, certainly not the circles I walk in. And it is interesting that we heard from him. Uh, we heard from him first because Sonia sent every one of the writers of these books that we're covering uh, the fact that it was going to be done. I think he's the only one that we heard from. Uh, he wrote back sort of a little email saying, uh, wishing us the best and hope many souls are saved. Uh, and so on, but then on his blog or whatever it is on on email, he had a pretty good little write-up about us. But I do want to uh, really extend to him my deep appreciation because also he put on there our whole lectureship schedule. So I appreciate that, and hope that some of those who think as he thinks will honestly listen to what I'm going to say, and we'll do that for all the rest of them. I want us to look at first of all and I'll try to go through the book just as, as it was done. Rush tells us how he came to write this book. He says that over uh, 
period of years. He had tried to teach three classes and all of them ended up in a big mess. And uh, they couldn't get past the work of miracles and things like that. And that was just a very bad situation as, as far as he was concerned. I, I read that and I thought, how can a person who's really what the Bible defines a gospel preacher to be make three attempts at teaching a class on the Holy Spirit over a period of about, I think he said, eight years and not be happy about it, made a mess out of it, and so on. What, what does that say about him that he admits that? How, how is it that a true gospel preacher uh, cannot understand the way the Holy Spirit works to save souls and convicting men of sin, converting them to Christ and keeping them saved? I would suggest to you, and I realize it's a suggestion, that he's looking for something that's not there. People yearn to have God doing things for them if for no other reason than to try to say it's really not all up to me. I suggest to you that the whole gospel scheme of redemption is all up to us when it comes to our study of the book, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, our understanding of it, and based upon that, our faith in God and Christ to take care of the situation. I also will say at the beginning, and I think I'll, I may have time to say it later, but I want this emphasized. It needs to be understood in our study of the Bible to understand the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whatever we're trying to understand, <laughs> that it's our responsibility. God has a responsibility. I suggest to you in the system of grace that's proclaimed in the gospel that God, that involves the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do have different, for lack of a better way to put it, roles or, or assignments in accomplishing what it has to do or what it has to do with our salvation. But I suggest to you God's done his part relative to making forgiveness of sins possible and um, the matter of keeping us faithful. That matters have to do with providence and God working behind the scenes. Uh, it, it, there's no way for the mortal human to understand all about that. Somebody want to tell me what Jesus Christ is doing specifically at this present time as he works in a place that's not governed by time? Well, you say he ever lives to make intercession for us. Uh, he's the only mediator between God and man. Fine. Now tell me specifically what is he doing involving those particular things. Do you have a picture of him sitting in a big royal chair right beside uh, the Father on the right hand? And that's all he does. He just sits there. Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, so what is he doing? What's the Apostle Paul doing right now? Do we think they're just sort of in a state of animation until whenever? So those things aren't answered. I have no way of knowing because the Bible doesn't address those things. I can get some ideas sometimes. Well, relative to what God does on our behalf, whether it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I know this. If I am loyal to the divine volume, if I am faithful as the New Testament describes faith, then... He's doing for me what I need to have done for me, and it's never going to uh, cause me to set aside my free moral agency and the responsibility I have to do my part in learning the truth and subjecting myself to it. That's my concern. When you look at what he has to write, you'll notice that even in his preface, he informs his readers that he came to write the book. And again, I refer you back to what I said, because these, these three feeble attempts... Well, what would make a person who's preached for so many years make such a statement as that and said it all ended up being a, a confusion out of three classes over that many years and he still did not get over what the Bible taught on the work of the Holy Spirit? What kind of an admission is that? That tells me then what he's running into because he informs us that his belief in a personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Christian led him to pose the following question. If the Holy Spirit is dwelling in the believer, what does he do? And that's not a bad question. But that's not where the, where the differences are with us and him. Brethren have always believed that the third person of the Godhead have, has indwelt each Christian personally. Fine. But all those people that I consider faithful when they say that have always said, if we want to know what the Holy Spirit wants us to do and so forth, you have to go to the sword, which is the word of God. 
and therein is the authority of Christ manifested, and that's how the Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs you, and in no other way. And that rules out any providential actions on God's part, uh, where he's working on our behalf. There is a big difference to what God does to us, what God does for us. And I think that uh, it's clear that the New Testament teaches that what he does to us is through an instrument. It's through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we must study it with an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, and we must be willing to submit to it. Now, as God told us to do that and then says, but you really can't do it under some circumstances unless you have supernatural power, divine power given to you directly to do this. Is that beginning to sound like somebody else? But this fellow wrote this 10 years before that somebody else came out with his direct work of the Spirit and his personal indwelling and direct work. Uh, it's amazing to me then that, that you have this kind of thing. Now remember, this book was written uh, back, uh, let's see, when was it? In the 19, 1987 copyright on it. That's quite a while ago. Now, his previously quoted question, if the Holy Spirit is dwelling in the believer, what does he do? He goes ahead to say that he, that he goes ahead to say that we ought to expect some kind of faithful, dynamic something coming from the Holy Spirit to our spirit. This is a direct Holy Spirit empowerment, and it furnishes the Christian with, with the wherewithal to reject and overcome all error, especially the error that views the Bible as any kind of law or pattern or blueprint or instruction to which Christians must will themselves uh, to conform their lives. You see, he's working out here and trying to say, really, it's uh, not all up to me. I don't know what there is about people that says that I can't be responsible to God for the way he made me to learn his will and subject myself to it. And we'll have more to say about that if time allows. Because he thinks the answer to this particular question will broaden our understanding of God and his real kingdom. So we haven't been broadened in that understanding unless we follow what he thinks he's gleaned from the Bible regarding this personal indwelling and direct work of the Spirit on your inward man and what he can supply. He tells his readers that as the Holy Spirit worked in Jesus, he works in Christians. Well, that's a big mouthful. He emphasizes that Jesus was deity, and this is an important point to note because it is blasphemy, that he's deity in the flesh, but he was virtually powerless until he was energized by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to know where he comes up with all that. Here's what he said. The Holy Spirit was energetic. The Holy Spirit was the energetic difference in this divine in flesh one. The Spirit shifted Jesus into the pattern of power. <clears throat> the Son of Man pursued, trod, and spoke that we might get the picture of the Holy Spirit working within the flesh person. That's what he was saying. Now he says that about Christ because he says, guess what? That's what he has for you as a Christian. So that when you use all of your willpower and your intellectual power to study the Bible, learn what the Lord wants you to do to be saved, having been saved from sin, then you have this to enlighten you, to give you more than what the Bible teaches. He declares this is the case because Jesus wants Christians to know they too must have the Holy Spirit working directly on their spirits in order to be shifted into the pattern of power. Now, he informed his readers that putting his thoughts on the direct work of the Spirit, on the inward man of the Christian, for reasons we've just mentioned, is really risky business. And he says it's risky business to put it down in print in the book and then publish it because the wolves in sheep's clothing who own printing presses. And I knew then he was talking about us. In other words, if you dare to question me, if you analyze what I've written, that I put out in public for you to see. And I expect it to accomplish things with people and influencing them relative to the meaning of the words in my, in my book, which I suppose he thinks people can do that, but they can't do the same thing with the mind of God in words in the Bible. I know somebody's going to challenge me. Well, just know anybody that challenged me is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So his comment means that he expected some people, more likely members of the church, to disagree with his views on the Holy Spirit's work with, on, and in the Christian. And his comments indicate that he also expects his critics to go into print in opposition to it. Of course, Rush felt compelled to publish his views 
on the Holy Spirit's work in the way we've noted that he writes about it. And Payton, Klein Payton, the late Klein Payton, who wrote the preface, I think, to the book, touts the book, sings its praises, does say it's new ground, does say it's going to startle people and all this kind of stuff, but he doesn't tell us, he doesn't offer anything that would say Rush has taught any error, and he worked with a number of people at the then Sunset School of Preaching who reviewed it, and none of them had a thing to say that he wrote anything wrong. Well, I've already mentioned to you something that ought to raise the eyebrows of anybody. I suggest to you your eyebrows ought to be raised very high when somebody comes up with a leading and directing and guiding of people by something other than the Word of God. God ought to immediately say, well, I need to look into this more. What is this guy saying? So he said that, and he said he's plying some new ground and changing people's views on the work of the Holy Spirit through colorful, forceful, and convincing arguments. Well, they just weren't colorful, forceful, and convincing enough, Brother Buddy, for me. Uh, they knew they were going to be saying things that was not ordinarily believed in the churches of Christ. Well, that within itself not necessarily wrong, but it means they knew they were out there on the frontier of something that was going to shake things up. And, but Rush believes his book will do great good for the church. But why doesn't he want it analyzed? Why, why, why does he want to immediately poison the waters by saying, anybody that takes issue with me is a wolf in sheep's clothing? They even have printing presses. Well, it was all right for him to have a printing press and put the material out there. Why does it become bad for us to be able to answer and to examine it in print? Uh, some of the folks who claim so much love and kindness really show that under certain circumstances, they lost their love and kindness. They don't mind impugning your motives. So Rush seeks to impugn the motives of anyone who takes exception with his views on the Holy Spirit's work in Christians. He's saying to his readers, if, somebody, if you get a book that's attacking me, then what are you supposed to think about that book? Or that is the writer of the book. You're supposed to realize that, that they are really wolves in sheep's clothing. And by the way, the little writing he did on his blog or whatever it is, his site, it pretty well says that too. And he says we just must accept these things because it goes along with the territory of basically saying we're persecuting and uh, all this kind of junk. In, in view then of his position on the direct work of the Holy Spirit on the inward man of the Christian, would Rush say that the Holy Spirit directly guided him to declare that any opposition to his book would be the work of wolves in sheep's clothing? After all, what good is this personal direct work on his spirit to give him this enlightened power if it didn't act in that way for him to write his book? Or do we have in his book then some sort of a off-handed inspiration in writing what he wrote? For he's claiming the Holy Spirit can offer people this directly as they work on the inward man or the spirit of a person. How could it not influence what he wrote in this book? I'm just wondering why it took all 10 years and three loused up classes before he ever got to this thing. Why didn't he work a little earlier? I'll have to say that it's this man that's a wolf in sheep's clothing. But I want to notice another thing here. He talks about numbing, like you get your mouth numb and you go to the dentist, a numbing experiences. And he says, without the spirit, I'm quoting now, our religious exercises will only prove more numbing and more deadening. Well, from that statement, we may rightly conclude that Rush thinks that even with the Spirit's personal, direct, inward, enabling power, our religious exercises will be only less numbing and less deadening. So look at his logic. According to Rush, we can have either religious exercises that are numbing and deadening, or we can have religious exercises that are more numbing and more deadening. But you're gonna, they're, they're all going to be numbing and deadening, whether the Spirit's there or not. I wonder if he really didn't let that slip in what he was trying to say. But he couldn't, could he? because he has the Holy Spirit's empowerment directly on him, he would make a statement like that. Now, what does that begin to tell you? So in view of his own conclusion about our religious services, what does Rush's doctrine about the Holy Spirit's personal di direct work in and on the Christian's inward man have to offer our religious services that would move them beyond numbing and deadening or more numbing and deadening because that's all he's got to offer? Even with the direct work of the Spirit in you today, you can't get past them being either less numbing and deadening or more numbing and deadening. But numbing and deadening, they will be, Holy Spirit notwithstanding. 
Now, leaving these things, they were basically stating the preface of his, of his book. He points out that in the creation of the world, the Holy Spirit brought order to it. Well, that's a great revelation, isn't it? He then says that the Holy Spirit does the same thing for the one who undergoes the new birth, except his work on man is a recreation. He writes this. He recreates order, organization, purpose, and reason, end quote. Then he says that's to, to the end that our, quote, new life can be restored to one fruitful and powerful expression. Now, remember, you can't do this. You can't have that more powerful and fruitful expression unless the Holy Spirit's personally directed your spirit and enabling you some kind of power that's beyond your human power and beyond your will to submit to the will of heaven that's recorded in the Bible. This simple statement of the fact of the matter doesn't necessarily address the manner or mode or the how that a thing is done. You see, I believe, and I think we all have to teach it because I believe the Bible teaches it. I was convicted of my sin by the Holy Spirit. I was converted to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, and I am kept faithful to God by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a statement of fact. Now, does the Bible address the manner or mode in which God does that? Well, if it doesn't, all I can do is state the fact of it. And I won't know the manner or mode, the how. But the Bible tells us uh, that it is through an instrument the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that God does not bypass the way that he made you to come to understand anything, reason with it, and draw a conclusion, but yet he works through the way he made you to understand. It would be rather ridiculous if God made us intellectual creatures to gather information, to reason with it, to come to conclusions with a will to act on it, or reject it as the case may be, if it's and then just dodge around that way. In other words, he made us this way to understand something, but when it came to revealing us the most important thing to us, our salvation, that he then just said, well, I won't pay any attention to the way man comes to understand anything. That's basically what he's saying. And we must understand that that's not enough, and you're going to see he really has a low opinion of what the Bible really is. He cites the following scripture proof of what he's advocating. He cites John 3, 3 and 5, Ephesians 1, 13, 14, Titus 3, 5, and a number of passages along that line to say there's this personal, direct connection of the spirit with the human spirit, the Christian, and there's this power coming directly from the divine being connected there to give you whatever you need. He says concerning those scriptures, and they're in the book. I'm not going to just list them off here. He says all that list of scriptures, quote, all this is so simple. Why didn't we know this before? We never read it this way before, or we would have believed it years ago. But he spent eight years stumbling around trying to teach the classes what was going on then. It seems like to me that was the time that he needed whatever the Holy Spirit had that he claims he supplies, if he ever did, when he's bumbling around and things. And he was a, supposedly a Christian then, and a gospel preacher. Shouldn't he have had this wherewithal from the Holy Spirit way back before that, before he started preaching? Uh, could it be, though, that one reason faithful brethren have never read it this way before is simply because the inspired words themselves in their proper context do not say what Rush says they do? So unless one reads what Rush believes into the previous list of scriptures, the words of the passages themselves do not convey. They do not say so or teach a direct work of the Holy Spirit on the person undergoing the new birth, John 3, 3, and 5, or on the inward man of the Christian in his day-to-day -day living. Now, again, I emphasize to state the fact of a matter is not to state the manner or the mode whereby a work is done or accomplished. Now, I said he had a low estimation of the Bible. Let me read you a quote. It is my observation and this is some observation. My observation that you can announce the term phones, all they still get turned off. It's my observation that without the Holy Spirit, the Bible only makes earthly sense. Now I'd like to make a comment like that, you know it's an effort to try to say something nobody else has ever said. And you have to pursue further reading to know even what he means by it. How about needing to define terms? Well, you have to read the book, so he'll tell you this. But he says. 
He's observed without the Holy Spirit, the Bible only makes earthly sense. Now watch. <clears throat> I'm thoroughly persuaded. I wonder if he was persuaded without reason. I'm thoroughly persuaded that the scriptures become, now listen, nothing more than a book of blah if we're not spirit led. See, there's, I guess that's the reason he loused all that up back those years of trying to teach those classes. It was just a book of blah. Then he says, how is it that so very many who attend church can't make this powerhouse of a volume work? That powerhouse of volume is the Bible, you know. So he's, he's concluding, and it's an assumption on his part, that they can't make it work. Well, what does he mean by that? Can't we understand the plan of salvation? Can't we understand what the Bible says about the church? Can we understand what the Bible says about its work, its organization, its worship, its mission? Can we understand what the Bible teaches about man's responsibility to God when he marries as a husband, what the Bible teaches he ought to be doing or not be doing as a father, what he ought to do, the same with the woman? Can't we understand that really the Holy Spirit said it does furnish us unto every good work? But he says, we're spiritless, I continue the quote. And friend, until we can concede that Jesus was virtually as ordinary as we, Biblical instruction will forever be held captive by earthly sense and earthly wisdom. Now, I guarantee you one thing he'll do. He will be like a lot of other people and say that the principles of logic are really just depending on your own powers and not depending on the power the Holy Spirit can give you directly by his personal indwelling and that you must have or you're just reading a book of blah. So if you don't believe the Holy Spirit's in you personally and personally directly working on you to do the things that he did, when you pick up your Bible to read it, it's just a book of blah. Well, I think that's the very depths of blasphemy. He's clear and he's concise and he's frank and he's candid in this quotation. I'll give him that. According to Rush, without then this direct work, the Bible only makes earthly sense. Now we understand what he's talking about. And it's only a book of blah. So the Bible, without the Spirit in the person reading that Bible, to give him all this stuff directly from God, which is beyond the instructional powers of the sword of the Spirit, then the book's really no good. It's got to, you've got to be energized. You can't just pick up the Bible on your own and study it and learn the mind of God on things spiritual. So he's saying that one's own intellect Rational powers and willpower are simply insufficient to allow one to understand the Bible and consistently obey the will of God manifest in the words of it. He does not think Bible information gleaned from one's own honest study of the divine volume is adequate to convict one of sin, convert one to Christ, and keep one faithful to God. What is it in reality that he's teaching? Well, he's just simply evidencing then his disdain for the divine volume standing alone as the Bible, the inherent, the final, the complete, objective, humanly attainable revelation of God to man. You can have all that, but without the personal indwelling and the direct work of that personal indwelling spirit to infuse within you all of this, it's a book of blah, and you're not going to benefit from it. And if you try to teach on it, you'll make a mess out of it even if you call yourself a gospel preacher and you try three times over eight years. Now, to further emphasize his doctrine of this alleged direct work of the Spirit on the inward man of the Christian, he wrote this. The one that empowered Jesus and indwelt Peter empowers and indwells God's child today. I noticed in reading through this, he makes no distinction <clears throat> between the work that Jesus came to do and why he came to do it. And the apostles and what they did and the miraculous elements. I think if you really put it to him directly, if you could ever get him squashed into a corner where he would stay there and not slip and slide out of the way, he is not going to take a position that says miracles have ceased. He may redefine it, but after all, I think you'll see that's what he's looking for, something beyond your intellectual and rational power and something beyond the Holy Spirit's teaching in the New Testament, something more than those things. 
and that you have to have that from God or you're fighting a losing battle. He affirms, and I quote, with him, Holy Spirit, we gain strength, invisible, direct strength to do kingdom work. Well, we all know what the Bible says about the work of the kingdom. But evidently we can't do it unless we have what he describes as this direct work of the Spirit to infuse you with this. He also announces, and I quote again, Christians are led by the Spirit conclusively. Now this gets good here. In that we are able to see secret signals. We must be a member of the Messiah Lodge. Secret signals. You realize what that saying? We'll say more about it a little later. Oh, I got something you don't have. You folks just have the Bible. I've got the Holy Spirit, third person of the Godhead, indwelling in me personally and directly. He connects to my spirit, and he is able to let me see things. And all those things that to you are things that go bump in the night and scare you, and you know what it is, I know what they are. I can receive secret signals. And you know, that, that reminds me of the old false doctrine of the Gnostics back in the first century and later on. <clears throat> they were big on letting everybody know who didn't accept their views that they alone had knowledge of spiritual things no one else had. In effect, what he's saying here is that those who believe what I teach regarding the Holy Spirit and his work on the inward man they have these secret signals from him that enlightens them, and no wonder you poor fools can't see these things. And in effect, that's what he's saying by implication. He may not like implication, but that's exactly what he's saying. He's trying to whet our appetite to say, don't you want what I have? Don't you want to be able to look at things, and then you'll see things because the Holy Spirit will help you see it that you can't get just by going in this book of blah. And if you just depend on that without the Spirit's aid, bad shape. He's chiding those who don't believe his doctrine with something. I thought of this, like children. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo, we know something you don't know. So indeed, what does this view tell us about Rutch's estimation of his own knowledge of spiritual matters? Does it tend to say, I'm pretty, I'm pretty potent here. You better listen to me. I see the signals you can't see. You better listen. This book is a revelation of how I came to have all of that. And it must be, therefore, a book that gives you an insight into why I have knowledge you don't have. Well, he concludes his book with the following statement. Or uh, I say he does. I, I guess it's the best way to sum it up. May we be as committed to telling neighbors about Jesus as we have been to tell ourselves that the Spirit does not work within us. Now, I want to know what faithful child of God and all that faithful child in God means as the Bible defines it. I want to know what gospel preacher, as the Bible defines gospel preacher, has ever taken the position that the Holy Spirit doesn't work within us. I believe he does. I believe his sword teaches that he does. But you see, what he does here is say, you don't believe it, if you don't believe he doesn't directly work on your spirit, giving you more than what the word of God can give you, then really you don't believe it. So I've never taught the spirit does not work within us. I don't think faithful brethren here have taught that. I know, I don't know of any gospel preachers that I said that if faithful to the cause, the teaching of the Bible that have taught such a thing as he accuses some. But you have to, Follow him and get in his mindset and thus in his context is the whole reason he wrote the book. And the influence he's trying to exercise over everybody else to get them to thinking and seeing things like he does. Now, if you follow his view, what view are you going to have this book? It's insufficient. It gets you started. That's all it can do. It'll tell you about a lot of things. But if you really want to get these secret signals, if you really want to be empowered so that you'll be able to properly use the Bible or else it's going to be a member of a book of blah, then you've got to have these things. Now, I want to stop and pause, uh, pause here and say this. Why is it that the fellows back in those days out at sunset, and he mentions Payton, Baggett, and Stewart, 
When they read what I just covered so far, why didn't they say something about the error that's here? It just goes right ahead to say why Sunset for many, many years has given up more and more of the fundamental teaching of the Bible and they've allowed for all this kind of stuff and they've given their imprimatur on it to say this is great. You read the preface that, that Payton wrote, it's a great book. Or you may disagree with some of it, but it really challenges us. It's a great book. Well, evidently then they thought this about these words of the Holy Spirit. What is the difference in Rush and these brethren? Well, let me say again, that is, any of us, like I think most of us are in this room, he believes that the Holy Spirit must, it's imperative, it's obligatory, that he must personally and directly work on the inward man of the Christian in order to provide for the Christian, guess what? What the scriptures cannot supply to us. And that his own human strength is too weak, too insufficient, to accomplish in resisting and overcoming Satan's efforts to keep one from sinning. In other words, you don't have enough power in you to read the Bible, understand it, and if there's a prohibition, to stop yourself from doing it. You have that power, at least under some circumstances. You don't really have the power in and of yourself alone to read the mind of God and the words on your level of understanding offered to us the way God made us, come to the proper understanding of what God wants, and then do it. You've got to have the direct work of the Spirit on your inward man. Then the Bible ceases to be a book of law. Then you will be able to see the secret signals. Then you'll have, of course, enlightenment that somebody just with the Bible only does not have. So, if I stop right here, I think that's enough error to keep things... <laughs> Messed up for a long time. Now, I, I don't disbelieve what the Bible teaches about. I don't disbelieve what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit's miraculous work <clears throat> done among and by men for the very reasons that Jesus did the miracles he did and the apostles did the miracles that they did. I don't oppose the Bible's teaching concerning God's providential work on behalf of four Christians. I think the Bible teaches us that he does that. Indeed, who is it that knows all that God does, as I asked earlier, on behalf of or for his faithful children? But whatever and what all God does on behalf of or for a Christian does not alter one's own personal responsibility for one's own actions. I suggest to you his position takes a whole lot of our responsibility for our actions away. And you can almost say, the Holy Spirit thou gave us me. He did guide me and I did act. <laughs> that can't be. We are responsible for our actions. There can't be a day of judgment coming, folks, except that I'm responsible for my actions. And God's going to expect me to give an account for my thoughts and my words and my actions. That's why we have in Colossians 3.17, that seems to be a pretty good message from the Spirit, that whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. I must have Bible authority for what I believe. Now, he must have Bible authority for the stuff he teaches, but I couldn't find the teaching of the scriptures that supports it. Let me say quickly, any doctrine teaching that God influences a person in any manner, now listen, that takes away from, augments, or hinders one's personal responsibility for one's own actions is a false doctrine. And I don't care how you work. Whatever God teaches us, it does not bypass the way he made us to understand anything. And it doesn't take away from us our responsibility to will to do his will. So whatever strengthening God has for the Christian does not take away from one in any form, fashion, or any degree that responsibility to God and thus our accountability to him of which we must Explain, if you please, or give an account of on the day of judgment. So to teach that one's God-given human will to make decisions and one's human power or strength to act upon them is insufficient for one to obey God's will in becoming a Christian and living the Christian life is tantamount to demanding, and he does, that some other power or strength superior to one's human strength 
must be directly available and applicable to the inward man of the Christian from someone other than the Christian himself who needs it. That's what he's teaching. You don't have to just depend upon your own powers to understand the truth and you're dedicating dedicating of yourself to understand it and doing what's necessary to understand it, learning how to rightly divide the word of truth and with an honest and good heart ascertain the will of heaven for your life. And that's on your shoulders to do that. And you can't lay it off on anybody else's. Even the Holy Spirit. So according to Rush, that superior strength or power comes from the person of the Holy Spirit who through his personal indwelling directly furnishes divine supernatural strength to the inward man of the Christian when one's own human strength is insufficient for one to keep God's commandments. Now you know who that sounds like. It sounds like MacDever. But this was said some 10 years. Published in a book some 10 years before Mac became vocal, well known in his position. I raised the question in the book, could it be that Mac had been listening to people like this for a while? Well, I can't answer that question because I don't have the facts, but I do know things do influence us. I do know when you begin to research on any project, you read everything you can get on it. I do know that you have to be careful about being prejudiced if you're going to engage in an objective venture. Keep yourself from reading into things, what you would like to see there, when really it doesn't say it. So there can be all sorts of things that can influence a person, but I do know this. If Mac wasn't influenced by him directly through his book or any other way, it's interesting that Brother Mac came along later on to embrace basically what these people were saying, and what he said, and what he teaches other people, which is that you don't have enough, but all you've got is the Bible and your power to understand it and your will to submit to whatever it is that God is submitting to you and to resist temptation to sin in and of yourself. Because like Rush, Mac teaches in order to overcome certain temptations, your human strength is insufficient. Thus, the personal indwelling direct work of the Spirit is there to infuse you with divine strength so that when your strength fails, you will have the wherewithal to resist the temptation. Now, if that doesn't say that you're not totally responsible for your actions, what does it say? Because after all, people apostatize, don't they? People fall from grace, don't they? Did the Holy Spirit fail them? Because the reason I'm told by Rush and by Brother Mac that you've got the direct work of the Spirit on your spirit, one reason, is to strengthen you so you won't fall when your human strength is insufficient. But people do fall, do fail. And that's the reason I oppose, and one reason I oppose so much this kind of doctrine. Number one, it's just not what the Bible teaches. Number two, it implies then that you can't make it to heaven by your own will and intellect to know the truth and subject yourself to it. That you're going to have to have infused in you the strength from God that is direct strength. I close here, and that basically says what I said. Those are the whole lot four in here. And I hope you'll read it. If you've got any questions, please keep that in mind. Write those questions down because we do have open forums in the next three days. And we can't cover everything. Buy the book. Buy five books. Buy a case. And help us distribute it. Thank you very much. What uh, more can be said than what's been said? But I'm going to try. <laughs> I recall uh, sometime after World War II, uh, Winston Churchill, who, who had already been turned out of office by that time, remarked about uh, uh, one of the opposition leaders, I think it was Clement Attlee, it may have been Aiden, but one of those guys that he saw walking down the street, and he said, look, there goes a sheep in sheep's clothing. I would suggest to you that even though uh, uh, those of Brother Rush's stripe consider us wolves in sheep's clothing, I would say that he's a sheep in sheep's clothing. But he's a particular kind of sheep. He's a Judas sheep. And there are many of those, and we're going to deal with a lot of the Judas sheep during this lectureship, but the wolf is sending out these Judas sheep to lead the sheep astray. The wolf's not even having to work. 
got the Judas sheep to do that for him. And when the wolf howls during the night, sounds just like a roaring lion. So we'll deal with these uh, uh, Judas sheep doing the stuck ship. And if they think of us as wolves in sheep's clothing, so be it. Where are we going to expose them? Uh, we'll be uh, dismissed now for about 10 minutes. If you would gather again at the bottom of the hour, then we'll have our uh, regular worship period and, and then uh, uh, speaker of that hour too. You're dismissed.